suppression of the use of marijuana and of the forces lurking behind it are the most important jobs this department is now engaged in. In 1930, the records on marijuana in the Washington office of the Narcotics Division scarcely filled a small folder like this. Today, they fill cabinets. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Coloradians, and everyone that's smart enough to listen from the outside. It's one of the most amazing plants we've ever discovered. The pot party, the trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones, all gathered in secrecy and flying high as a cup. Please! And there's no video this whole month because we're fucking busy. That's right, y'all. We're back with a new episode of Stole the Petite. Well, your host, as always, it's me, Kip, the guy that sounds like Bill Paxton and looks like Bill Paxton. And to my left, I got CB, the guy that sounds like he's been smoking cigarettes for 92 years. How are you, CB? <laughs> um, the COPD's got me scrambling. Uh, I'm doing okay, you know. I put down the smokes last night, so we're we're on the up and up. There you go. Uh, you know, quitting is, you know, no, quitters never prosper. But it, maybe you'll last a little longer without the upper respiratory infection, y'all. We have a freaking doozy of an episode. As everybody knows, our biggest event of the year, not our Mardi Gras party, our March Madness bracket is a. To be unveiled by the end of this week, we will be in the thick of it. We've got a litany to talk about today. This one may go over 30 minutes, so if you have a long commute, we've got you covered. If you have one of those baby commutes, maybe a short skis, break it up into two. It's going to have the whole gamut. We're talking everything from our badass t-shirts on sale and what we've got coming up next. We've got our dinner party recap. Yep, Mardi Gras was a fucking blast, and it ruined the rest of my week. My fucking face and back hurt the whole week. Um, we've got best things you ate last week. We got some restaurants that have returned into the fold. Uh, Kip taught a college course. We're going to dive into that. And then we have March Madness preview. And then before we leave, we'll do TV. But we're also going to tease everybody about what's going on in our lives and what Kip's going to be doing next week that's going to break the mold of this podcast forever. I mean, are we going to have a viral month? I mean, if so, if you don't mean like the studs that I have <laughs> on my pec, yeah, you're for sure. We're about to go and do numbers. And it wouldn't be possible without our sponsors, Chris. Our friends over at Mr. B's Liquor. Yeah, they have three locations across the metro area. The location out next to last year's March Madness champion in the Stanley Marketplace just down the hall from Annette. They also have a new location that is in the Golden Triangle. So if you have to deal with the people on Capitol Hill, what better way to solve your fix than having a cocktail or picking up a great bottle of natural wine. And then, of course, our favorite location, the location right there. We call it the ballpark. It's right near the Rhino neighborhood. They've got a litany, not only of natural wines, the good old world stuff. They've got high end and normal approachable bourbons and whiskeys. And they've got a wall to wall cooler of great craft beer. So no matter what you may be hunting, there is a Mr. B's close to you. And they are our supporting sponsor for the March Madness and for the the month of March, so we're fucking stoked to have them. Yeah, pro tip: if you're ever visiting Annette and want to be uh, just friendly, go pick up like a six or twelve pack and give it to the staff after you dine there. Oh, that's actually a really good idea. Yeah, I've done it before. It's uh, great. They yeah. love it. Yeah, and you know, I went to uh, Snipe Burger this weekend, and to show my appreciation, I took them a fuck ton of weed. I was like, thank y'all. Here's some infused pre-rolls. Here's some flour that I got from standing at Kimbo's, the best deals in the state. Had to share it. And a couple cartridges, just for the fellas to catch a fade. You but, know? yeah, Mr. B's is... Is ridiculous. It's great. It's a great spread, great selection, great price point, too. They're not going to break your bank or bend you over the barrel, but at the same time, you'll be supporting local Colorado natives. I know the Brothers Blouse. Um, I think I said that properly. And I know that they've always been here to support everyone in our community, and so we're stoked that they are, uh, they're here to also support our restaurant industry friends as well. So we're excited. You're going to hear a lot from them. You'll see them on our special feeds coming up. Um, but they're not the only sponsor, Chris. Who's the next one? You know our friends over at Bar Green Ellingson. If you happen to work in the restaurant industry, maybe you're a back-of-house team. Maybe you're actually trying to get your restaurant up and going and the fucking city's holding you back with permits holler at bar green i oftentimes hear people say damn i wish i'd have just worked with you know the better company coming out the gates to alleviate some of those headaches when building out your kitchen bar green has been doing this in the industry for fucking 
forever. And so when they j- they jumped at the opportunity to be our sponsor last year, and so we're stoked to have them again this year. They'll be giving a thousand dollar give uh, gift certificate to the winner of the March Madness bracket. And I'm going to try to you know grease the palms, grease the cock, see if we can get something for the second place team as well. But the first te- place team is going to be coming home with some very nice quarter pans this year, Christopher. Love that. Pots and pans abound. Fuck yes. So the chefs will also be rewarded, and so will the staff. Mr. B's is going to hook everybody up with a, a care package from their stores for the winning restaurant, and so are our friends from Cali's Cannabis. It's a recreational shop. Y'all hear us talk about standing at Kimbo, but Cali's is coming back into the fold because they love supporting the restaurant industry as well. They have three locations across the metro, up in North Glen, down on Kenosis Court, and then they have one on Larimer, right there in Rhino, right in the hotbed of the restaurant scene. So we're fired up to have those three sponsors with us for the month. I'm fucking exhausted. Let's talk t-shirts. Oh, my God. I mean, could they have been any better? Like, kudos to the ideas. Chris, I mean, we've been stewing on these things for years. You know, like, oh, we want to replicate, you know, funny shirts, but our name in it. And so while we started with the Waffle House, you can see it on our website, or excuse me, on our social media. You can buy the shirt on coloradolimited.com. There are some friends of ours here in the Denver community, lifers, you know, natives, Love the community. They work with a lot of big wigs in the scene, you know, the Colt Coors Molson family. And they brought us into the fold, and they are going to help us design a litany of different themed shirts. The first one sold out in about four hours, so we restocked them. Go buy them. If y'all buy them, we can release new shirts. That's kind of the game. Hats are coming. You can find all of them at Colorado Limited. I mean, they are fucking fly as shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the great thing about it is it's a piece of uh, both of our childhoods and early adulthood. Waffle House takes the cake for just good eats. It was the first place I ever got pimp slapped. <laughs> You know, just got put in my place real quick for getting a little mouthy right there at the table. Um, you, a lot of firsts happen at Waffle House. I think that was the first, you know, public hand jibber I got was at a Waffle House as well. So, you know, the homage to our friends over there, you know, whether it be hurricane season, fight season, there's something for everyone at Waffle House. So we want to channel their energy and our energy in our new product line. And if you haven't been to a Waffle House, Stone, then you've probably never been to a Waffle House. Yeah, if you go sober, p- blessings. You know, usually I'm hungover, but I still have a little bit of the nighttime buzz from the one before. Um, at the same time, you don't really get the same feel or pizzazz at the Colorado Waffle Houses. No, they they aren't the same. Yeah, they're almost like the Midwest nice instead of that. What are you having, hun? And then they're like, we're out. I said we're out. You know, <laughs> like you you need a little bit of that chip on your shoulder. Don't sass me. And we don't get that from fucking Thornton or Lone Tree, where it's like a bunch of golfers in there. You know, it's just a different scene in the Colorado market. Juxtapose, we grew up where I watched a police car get robbed, you know, right outside of a Waffle House. I was like, that sucks. But if the cop went outside, then everybody inside would have gotten their ass kicked. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw a couple titties there. Yeah. For sure. That's where boys become men. And it's a great place to take your kids because they're so used to dealing with drunks all the time or drug addicts that they're like, honey, we'll clean up after your kid. He's the least of our fucking worries. So it's a family-friendly environment just like this podcast, and that's where the T-shirt homage comes from. Buy it. Go buy it. (laughs) Fuck. Please buy it. You can find the link in our bio on social media. You can also go to coloradolimited.com. Okay, next up on the list, dinner party recap. Oh, man. I mean, like, it was awesome. It went great. But, you know, we really got uh, pulled into the workforce just with, uh, you know, some team members being down and stuff. But that's the cool thing about hospitality and all that. Everybody comes together. Chris, my feet still fucking hurt. And so I want to give a shout out to our industry friends because <laughs> it's not like I think your job is easy. They, I've been in that position, but not regularly being in that position to going to walking 10 miles in like fucking sneakers that have like not been like creased at all. Oh, my God. I put down 9.9 miles, 19,000 steps. Um, Catahoula Catering killed it in the kitchen scene, but you were right. They were short staffed, so you took over Expo. You did all Expo. Everything had to get okayed by CB himself before going to the tables. And yeah, and y'all delivered. Everybody delivered. We all worked in. Tables were bust. Meals came out. It was And, and the meals were great. I don't I, – I, 
I'm trying to decide my favorite because, God damn, the beignets with the Chantilly cream stuffed with strawberries. Those were reminded fucking... you of those porns that we used to watch on the scattered screens. <laughs> good cream pies. Those were fucking so good. And and the boudin balls. Those those were probably those were my two favorites. The boudin ball was just so damn good. It had that crunch and like if you don't know what boudin is, read a book. But at the same time, I don't know. Tommy that. will come back here. Yeah. <laughs> Click the button above your head. Um <coughs> oh, sorry, I'm high. <coughs> the boudin ball was magnificent. I thought the grits were great with the Nola barbecue shrimp and grits. Yeah. And the fact that it was just breaking bread amongst those at the table, um, our sponsors, bringing in Cushmasters and Growlytics to smoke out of Rituals gear. And then, of course, Callie's has all of these great offerings on their shelves. It was just awesome. And then the the pairings, like you have a fucking full gram joint coming every other dish. So you're having a cup of gumbo, and then here comes barbecue shrimp, but here comes another joint as well. And then the king cakes at the end. Our friends over at Standing Akimbo obviously have the best deals in the city, and they you, you can get things like – you know, outer other honey sticks, 10 milligrams. You can get a pack of those things for 15 fucking dollars where they're $30 elsewhere. It was just a great experience. We topped that shit with king cakes and the babies. It was awesome. Yeah. A note about those honey sticks. Uh, I Tread put some, lightly. <laughs> <laughs> unless you're like a 200 milligram eater. I put some in my tea the other day. It was really good. Like in flavor or did it get you high? Oh, I mean, it got me high, but, like, I dumped it in, like, some hot tea, just as, like, honey in a tea, and it was perfect. It's very approachable, the outer other honey sticks, similar to that of, like, a Ripple, who also were present at the party. They gave away gummies to all of our friends in the gift bags. Um, the honey sticks are very approachable, especially for, let's say, like, maybe you have a family member that you mail uh, drugs to, or maybe, like, older family members that live here in Colorado – these rosin honey sticks work because they're a little more approachable. You can cut them in half. You can cut them in quarters. They're 10 milligrams, but you cut your stick in you know, a quarter at a time. You can squeeze that into a tea or even into a recipe, and it's just a, it's not a crazy buzz. It works if you eat the whole thing, but you can kind of dose yourself appropriately. You know, So if you're an older person, dipping your toe into the game, two and a half milligrams, five milligrams with your evening tea may help you sleep through the night without, you know, an adult diaper or whatever. It's just a, it's a great object. I like them. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that party was great, but yeah, I mean, hats off to the Catahoula catering company. I'm sad to see him leave in Colorado soon, but yeah, they're moving down to Austin, Texas. So if y'all want to get true Cajun flavors, it's fucking impossible in this city. Um, unless you go to like one-off locations like them or Barbosa Barbecue, who are originally from Baton Rouge. Um, I don't, you know, I like the the Bayou Brothers as well. They do boudin and they mule it up. But I just don't trust a lot of the Cajun food here as somebody that grew up on quality Cajun food. It just it's, there's not a fair representation that I wet my whistle on, um, so I just don't recommend it. You know, if you want a good gumbo, make it at home kind of vibe. Exactly. Um, all right, yeah. So that dinner was great. Also, special shout out to our friends Amy, Chris, and Patrick. Uh, we can't do things without you know the community and your friends lifting you up, and they were there to pick us up when we fell, Chris. And I just can't thank them enough. And a special shout out to the Bents crew. Man, those pre rolls, cartridge, those live resin cartridges, fucking stroke, and then they have the gummies too they have that whole gamut so they have something for everybody on their product line and so i really like working with them if y'all are looking for a good quality product that won't break the bank maybe it's not a 500 or it is a 500 milligram live resin but it's not going to just like you're not going to suck it dry in an hour like you do some of the you know brand name brands here in the community so if you know what i'm talking about these will go a little bit the extra mile and it's a quality product so i give them a recommendation for sure <sighs> i'm tired we're almost through. I know. Um, and it's probably because we've got a lot of good shit coming down the pike that I'm getting really excited about it, and I bust my nut too quickly. So I was fired up in that intro, and it, one of the reasons was we can talk about the things that we ate last week that we didn't have to serve. So let's talk best places we ate last week. It was Mile High Asian Food Week. Give me the rundown. So I unfortunately didn't get out as much as you did, but obviously I wanted to support some restaurants during the Mile High Asian Food Week, and uh, so I ventured over to Meta Asian. Dude, 
great stoner snacking. I mean, it, it, it really is great. And, you know, the funny thing is, is I guess, when did I go over there? I went over there on, like, Tuesday night or Wednesday night. And the funny thing about it is, like, it wasn't that bad. Like, like crowd-wise? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I was, I was upstairs. It was basically us just sitting at the bar, eating on some grub. Um, we did the bow buns, which are great. Did you get pork belly? We 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 did all three. Oh, there you go. Smart. Yeah, you well, got Yeah, I mean, you might as well bag. get the sampler. Um, and then we did like a spicy noodle dish, which was good. The noodles, the noodles were a little different. Like they were, um, they were a little thicker. You like know, a they, bucatini almost. Yeah, but like a little, a little chewier, a little dense. I I loved it. I thought it was great. They have great cheese sticks too, and you know, obviously they're moving soon. They're they're about to open a location downtown. It may. I don't know when they officially open. They may be open. I can't remember. Um, but, yeah, they're getting out of Fonsi, and I don't know who's going in next. Someone may have mentioned it. But I can't remember who it was. Um, that place slaps, though. It's a good casual eatery, you know, and if you don't have to fuck with the, the terrible crowds that usually hang out there on the weekend, it's solid. Um, I ate at a couple of Asian spots that technically weren't participating in Mile High Asian Food Week just because my schedule didn't really, like, reflect being able to we were just busy as shit last week and so i was able to do lunches and so i did lunch dim sum star kitchen i think the key in star kitchen nowadays is to order off the menu i was talking with a chef in town and he's like everyone drew gravitates towards the dim sum but if you look at like the salt and pepper crab and the lobster obviously those are big names and words and prices on the menu but you're about to spend that same kind of price on a dim sum so you look at the menu next time you'll go to star kitchen obviously we talked about Hong Kong barbecue last week. Those chicken wings are fantastic. We're going to take the guys from King of Wings and Snipeburger out to Hong Kong barbecue to try their chicken wings. Um, so we're going to have that happen in the coming weeks, Chris. Get ready. You know, just take just to tell them thanks for being awesome to us and for them to recognize what a fried chicken wing is because I know theirs are grilled and theirs are returning in March. So um, I did. Dim Summit Star, we did Hong Kong, and then Hop Alley returned to the fold with their new renovation. Um, it looks a little bit nicer on that new side, whereas the other side was kind of, you know, casual, upscale, like fun, hip-hop, loud. Yeah. It's a little more dialed down. It's not dialed down. Like, you can still come in there with a crew and get rowdy because they have big tables in the back. But it's just nice. It's yeah. nice. And they're going to have their own little chef's table and bar back there so they can technically appease two sides with, you know, two different wells without running roadie crazy. Um, so those were the best things I ate. And, and your pizza was fucking good. You made a pizza. Yeah, we did pizza night the other night. Uh, that was fun. And uh, obviously something like, I mean, it, it really wasn't all that difficult to like really prepare and stuff. Like obviously Steph made some dough, but that wasn't over time consuming. And then once we get it dialed in on the BGE, we'll be burning pizzas all <laughs> summer long. Dude, we're going to have to throw a little party in the back, you know, like we do our dinner parties, but just a little more casual, maybe a little up the ante on the mushroom side a little bit crazier. <laughs> but then, I guess, like, speaking of good things we ate last week, uh, Steph and I decided we went down, and Friday happy hour, we swung by um, Sunday Vinyl. Ooh, it's which, been a minute since I've eaten there. Yeah, and we didn't, like, partake in a lot of food. We just had, like, a cheese and meat plate yeah, on their happy hour. Nosh. But the thing is, is, like, they've gotten a new chef, um... So, like, they've completely revamped food options, small bites, and things like that. So, they got a lot more approachable items. And also, speaking of, like, happy hour wines, you know, I know sometimes, like, price point at Sunday Vinyl can be a little scary and off-putting. But, dude, if you go in there for happy hour, we got a nice glass of wine for $8 a piece. And if you can get a glass of wine... At happy hour under ten bucks, it's a win. Yeah, and you know that's actually a good idea. Is we should try to find you know some of our favorite happy hours, not like the best deals, but you're having to fucking like eat shitty food or drink only fucking PBR. But we should kind of 
we'll, we'll have to talk about that. Maybe we bring that to the table in the coming weeks because this week we obviously have a loaded docket. But that's a gem that folks would love to know about, especially for those that maybe are using the public transit out of you know, Union Station. Or maybe the, your cunt of a boss is starting to make you come downtown again. And so you're like, I'm going to need a drink after I work. You can hit up the Sunday Vinyl Happy Hour. Yeah, and especially if you're looking, like, if you don't want to always go out to these pricier places, like, going in at happy hour and getting a drink and a food item or two, you can get out of there reasonable. No, and, that you know, it's it's kind of one of those things, like, you do that, then you maybe, like, eat a small snack that night at home, and you're set for the day. It's not like you're going to go home and be like... Oh, it's time to fucking eat lasagna. You kind of like shift your meal plan in that a- in that aspect, and so you know you eat a kind of an early supper by teeing off on two or three items. Yeah, you maybe eat an apple with some peanut butter before bed. And you're good as gold. Right, eat a light lunch and save it for a happy hour menu somewhere, and you can get out within like thirty bucks. Yeah, that's a good call. I like where your head's at. We're gonna keep putting those gems on y'all. Um, that's all we have for best things we ate last week. We have a bunch of cool stuff coming down the pike uh, we'll allude to here in just a little while. Um, I taught a college course last week. Dr. Wilson. No, no, no. PhD. No. Yes, yes. It was an honorary doc. Um, so there is a course about cannabis and hospitality, uh, like culinary worlds that kind of all blend pretty much what this podcast is, what we do in the community. And so I went to just – this class's project right now is throwing a cannabis event. And so they were like asking some questions. I told them about how we stumbled ass backwards into this career that I have. And it was a fun time. Shout out to Shannon for having me. Their class was fun as hell. They're, I mean, they, they were ranged in age. And it was just a cool group of people that are about to do some really cool shit in the community. And seeing those kinds of courses exist Gives us hope for maybe the industry as a whole because when I see things like topless cannabis uh, clubs in fucking Massachusetts, I'm like, can we get everybody out of jail first? But teaching people about cannabis kind of removes that stigma at, you know, such a level of education is actually the best way to remove stigmas, you know, or, you know, misinterpretations of medicine. And so I thought it was really cool. I did not impart a lot of knowledge because I'm not a very smart person. But I just got to shoot the shit and talk with these people for like 30, 45 minutes. It was a lot of fun. But you know about cannabis. A little bit. And I know where we can and cannot do these events <laughs> and how to stay under the the proper letter of the law and things of that nature. So I could at least impart that kind of knowledge and uh, I guess ways to engage with your community. I told him to start a podcast and do it for five years. And then, <laughs> then maybe. <laughs> but realistically, I see like, you know, hotels becoming more regularly accepting. Like there used to be smoking rooms. You remember in hotels? I feel like there'll be floors where you can maybe have a consumption lounge, you know, so you can go up there and consume and then go back to your hotel room in the future. And then having events in those places seems to be on the, the near future. And these people would be on the forefront of that. You know, they're all very personable. They are very kind. They are engaging, which I think is pretty cool, asking questions and having fun with it. And so that's what you want. From, you have to kind of be front-facing in all aspects. Could you imagine, like – Let's say you're like 17 and you're on like a family trip and y'all stay the night at a hotel as y'all are breaking up your trip and you just take a walk down, down, down a hallway and you found a consumption lounge and you just sneak in there. That would have been awesome. I mean, yeah, but it's kind of like the same concept of having fucking Charlie Brown at the bottom of your bar. Like you can smell the cigarettes, you can hear the piano. There's, you know, pretty good cheese sticks over there. You know, those things are all inviting to a child, and they serve alcohol. But at the same time, what we're starting to see with more of these youths, or youths, <laughs> as uh, cousin my cousin Vinny would say, um, are not, you know, it's you're seeing less people smoke at an underage. Like, the underage kids aren't smoking as much marijuana as they maybe they were, you know, like we were. You know, because it's a little bit more regularly accessible. So that if they've tried it, it's not as taboo. It's like, this isn't my vibe. Never mind. And so we're seeing, you know, this 
TikTok generation is smoking less cannabis than, you know, illegally smoking less cannabis. But we're seeing more re- people with residual income are smoking cannabis these days, especially as markets open across the country. So I think the, the future is bright. And then when you get to meet the next generation of people that are going to be movers and shakers in the community, it's pretty neat. So thanks again to Shannon for letting me come in and hang out. You know, one note on that, though, while the future is looking bright, I think, like, New York's facing some serious shit. Like, they're just... So is Colorado and California and a lot of other places, um, you know, and I'm about to kind of figure out where the world stands on it, because that's what I'm very curious. Like, are we... Is the capitalistic mindset of letting these venture capitalists come through? I saw somebody once say that there's way more suits than hoodies here at this meeting. And that was a concern for them. And it feels like we're losing that touch because everyone sees it as this cash crop. And so we may end up fucking ourselves in more ways than one, not only as a state by state, but as a country. And so I'm curious to see what others may be doing as they start to legalize it around the world. Yeah, I mean, because there's not one playbook to follow. So, But ours seem to be a really strong playbook in that, you know, the illicit or the black market, while it was still there because it will always be there. You know, it wasn't ruining wreck or medicine, medicinal prices. What we're seeing is a recession of sorts kind of starting to come in and people are trying to cut back on certain things or, you know, the cost of everyday goods have gone up. Inflation, yeah. things of that nature have caused the dollar to be a little bit weaker. So the cannabis kind of falls to the back of the uh, pecking order. But realistically, alcohol sales are up. So I hope to see that number start to flip as we start to see more folks become – more in tuned or it becomes more normal and approachable and allowed. You know? Yeah. Um, okay. Kip taught school next up the big conversation, Chris, it's worth the 25 minute mark, but we're here to talk March madness. It's March fucking madness. Um, it's going to be madness. This rating system that we have in place is madness. Um, what we've done is we've incorporated a committee. We've teased it in previous episodes, but I'm going to disclose the team. In real time right now. Um, First off, it's Kip and Chris. We will have uh, the majority say. We will both, we will, uh, we have eight different subcategories that we've created. Kind of spinoffs of last year where Chris and I debated what would be more prevalent. I think last year we had sushi as its own representation. And this year we removed it because we feel we wanted to get more diversity across different cuisines. And so while the Asian food and my favorite genre of food is not going to be as represented this time around just because it's going to be more competitive, still the top, the cream of the crop will still be there. Yeah. And so I don't think that's a big problem at all. But, yeah, so the eight subsets and we'll have five committee members joining us. The five will be Morgan from Mountains and Mimosas. She may be a little biased because she eats with us fair amount, but, you know, she also knows food better than I do. Her nose works better so she can taste things a little bit better as well. And she's kinder, so she probably eats places that I tell people to fuck off and I don't want to try. Um, so things like that. Uh, we will have our friend Denise Mickelson, two-time podcast guest. She is the uh, director of communications for the Colorado Restaurant Foundation. She used to be the 5280 food editor where she would publish their top 25 restaurants every year. So she's eaten just about Everywhere in this city, especially ones. And if they're new, she's still doing it as a member of the Colorado Restaurant Foundation. But she's not actually taking money specifically from restaurants or, you know, working in a paid capacity where she would could promote somebody over another she's we feel that she's fairly unbiased oh yeah and one thing we also note is that we tried to find folks that maybe have different uh, dining styles or like favorites and these are all people we know and the next one is our friend nam nam eats from the instagram uh she also knows the lay of the land in the community she's Is she a native of Colorado or just been here for fucking ever? Um, But what I do know is that she knows the food scene inside and out. And while she's not vegan, she loves going plant forward. And so she's put us on not only, you know, a bunch of dank food trucks, but also restaurants and pop-ups that have been going on around the community that are oftentimes healthier than not. And everybody knows I'm a fucking Popeye slut. So that was a glaring omission in my food regimen. So I thought she would be a fantastic addition. And she's a hoot and a holler to goof off with. 
And so committee meetings are a blast. Yeah, she brought great snacks for our last committee meeting. Yep. Um, our next member of the uh, committee is Mr. Jeremy Harland. Um, I don't know if you've seen him on our social media. He's a very big food advocate here in our community. He works. Uh, he travels around the country for work, so he gets to sample fare from around the country and, by comparison, you know, levy where we stand in the world. Um, he has a, a fine knowledge of open fired foods, barbecue, and things. That nature, which what barbecue was a subset last year of one of our prereqs. We've turned that this year into open fire. So it incorporates not just barbecue sauced foods, but places that are cooking things over open fire or with wood fire events. So uh, you'll see maybe a different representation in this one, but it's going to be a great one. Um, and then we have a few more members that will be joining us on the uh, committee. That's one, two, three guests we've announced, four guests we've announced. The fifth one, I'm still waiting, um, Alex Sagiamo. He's a friend of ours, used to work in the uh, food industry, moved to Colorado, knows the pop-up uh, truck game like none other. He's great at it. Uh, I see him all the time, and he just knows good food from his experience in working in the industry. So we got to get Alex's answers in before uh, Wednesday and before Thursday's episode, where we will be breaking down the bracket itself. But I wanted to talk with you, Chris, about the eight genres um, that we will be breaking them down into. Let's do it. Stoner Eats. So what do you think of when we say Stoner Eats? It, it, Pizza? It, it, because I'm thinking pizza and wings mainly, burgers maybe, things that are fried. I'm thinking, I'm thinking like, yeah, I'm thinking things that are fried, but I'm also thinking things that are like, just kind of a mess and something that you can, like maybe eat in your hand. So like tacos are always in play for stoners eats, and you know, I mean, yeah, burgers and stuff like that. Like also. What what's shocking, and I may throw something out there, but sweets. Sometimes, like when you're stoned, you That's want sweets. Idea. And we didn't have sweets last year. No, so and this gives them the ability to kind of get in there. Yeah, and the good thing the good thing that we're doing differently this year is everybody's going to be against different categories. We aren't driving everybody in one category to a winner. So it won't so, be like tamaki den versus sushi den in the first or second yeah. round. They'll all be dispersed, just like the March Madness pool. Like you could find a fine dining restaurant up against an ice cream shop and it, you know it turns out you know people love fucking ice cream exactly so, i mean We're anything can happen anything can happen up. and yeah and so we it's going to be crazy and i like where your head's at because incorporating sweets in that fashion but it's not just like oh you said this place has to be in so it's in we're doing it off a scoring scale so we had all of the committee members rank their top eight or top ten um the dogs are wanting to come down into the studio but we've ranked the top eight or ten in all eight of the subset categories that we created to classify the restaurants that would compete. And so the first, you know, like the objective is to have the most points and you will go on. So the top eight will automatically qualify, being the 64 teams. We will have play-in games, which will be wild card teams, teams that were competitive but didn't get all the way there. But I thought the Stoner Eats one is kind of crazy because it could have anything. Like maybe your stoner snack is Tom Ka soup. And so you want farmhouse or Suvipa or, you know, or maybe it's Woody's wings and things where they have great pad thai and wonderful chicken wings. Hong Kong barbecue falls into that category, you know? So I think that's going to be a really fun one. Yeah. Um, this one is where I believe, did Annette come out of the fine dining set? meant last year yeah i think so yeah so this is where our last year's champion came out of we'll have a fine dining and so i'm imagine annette will probably be near the top if not at the top of that one again yeah i mean for obvious reasons yeah and then we have we mentioned we've turned barbecue into open fire just to incorporate some more folks people that may be doing things on a spit you know um as well as maybe chickens that aren't necessarily barbecue but they're doing the lord's work in different places, you know, so we are going to have a little different representation in there. Maybe it's not a full-blown barbecue because they did get demolished fairly quickly once they got out of their own subset. So we'll see exactly where the barbecue people are. And one cool thing about splitting them all up, Chris, is maybe they all can work together as a community. It's like, 
let's all go promote our brother and barbecue, you know, as he goes up against a fine dining spot, like an, a tavernetta or something like that. Yeah, because the great thing about this fucking whole idea in our March Madness is it really – it's it, – it's about the community's love for a specific restaurant. And it's not like we aren't saying like this is the best restaurant in all of Colorado. We're saying this is the restaurant that got out there, promoted it, and their fans, their, you know, people who dine with them regularly came out and fucking supported. Because the more you share it, the more votes you get for your team or whoever you want to win. So it's just. Chris, I think we had over a million votes last year. I think we had five million impressions a day for about two weeks there. And it's because these restaurants should be able to take pride in it. Like, if you make it to the Final Four, that means that this community really loves your food. And, you know, we're going to have, because we have a committee this year, we're going to have representation like we never expected. Restaurants from all around the metro, not just places you and I went to eat. Right. You know, so we may have a glaring omission or two, and we may have somebody that was left out in the cold that made it last year classic you know wichita state or a colgate you know if you lose in the tournament you know your conference tournament you didn't get an at-large bid this year um but it's going to be a lot of fun and I, one cool thing is the community embraces it and this podcast we try to make things fun and we try to embrace the community so it's just a great way to showcase our love for the community and our restaurants in it what other uh, what other categories we got going on? So we got the Latin scene. We're gonna have an Asian category, and then this one it's kind of hard because you want like an Italian region for itself, but there's other food that does noodles, you know, that you want in. So we were thinking maybe fresh nudes, but we figured maybe the Asian or the stoner has that. So I did Euro as encompassing that and maybe some of our French friends in the community, you know, as well as some of the Mediterranean restaurants. Yeah, and all these categories are just kind of like general ideas to focus You're our, right, our uh, brainstorming. Yeah. And, you know, because like Asian, that can include like – Indian food oh, and does. things like that. There's so, going to be Indian representation. I can see it from having half the votes in already that it's not – we're not having six sushi restaurants in. We're actually letting more people have a voice in this because there's a lot of great food in the community. So, yeah, you know, Euro and you're all going to be dispersed, you know. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think one that last year maybe didn't get a lot of love that this year is, we're going to see a little bit stronger representation from voting is Spuntino. You know, James Beard Foundation, they were in it, I believe. But if, even if they weren't, they got the James Beard nod this past year. You know, they've been fucking doing numbers over at that restaurant. I think a lot more people are going to come out for them this year. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's great the, it, fucking food. It is good food. And it, it's, it's just one of those places due to the location. It's kind of right there by that park burger. And it's just... It's, Unsuspecting. Yes. And so you don't really... Like, unless you're looking for it, you aren't going to just pass it by. So it's one of those things you should go and check out. Don't forget about it. Oh, my God. Yeah, it is wonderful. They are doing – so it's like – what is it? Sin Sin Du, I think is her name. Uh, She's killing it in there with, like, Italian and Indian cross uh, influences. It's great. Okay, so here's a new segment because I felt we needed – this incorporated we've been published you know to talk about sandwiches we've been talking about bread you've been fucking scouring the earth for food trucks so these next two regions are somewhat new the first ones we called bready or let's get that bread it's uh that's on the mondays um but what that will include is sandwiches delis bakeries from the metro area because some of them like you were harping on bakery four not one month ago saying their breakfast sandwiches fuck worthy you know and so why shouldn't that be in the conversation with the same places that are winning best sandwich in the city or you know some that i find personally amazing and so we wanted to incorporate those because i think they can make a run yeah especially uh, some of them have a following on social media and and this city loves pastries so i mean like and those those count just as well as a meal because they are a meal yeah and so we will have a lot of uh we're gonna have some representation here for it's gonna be great i'm very excited about it Um, and then the last one is gonna be trucks and pop-ups so that last year was not a thing i think we had yan wonton was in the asian food region not Whereas this year she'll probably be Penelope, Knockers, and Rob will probably be in the food truck region. Right. 
just for qualifying. You know, yeah. like they'll probably end up ranking up fairly high on most everybody. I mean, if they're not, that's a big omission from somebody. But I imagine they will have more than enough points through the truck category, you know, for them to qualify even if they were under Stoner Eats. So we wouldn't give them that one. You get the one where you get the higher points. So if you fall in two categories under Stoner Eats and Bready, Wherever you have higher points will take you off the other list, and then I will show. That's how we'll do it. I, I, I feel like uh, I feel like pop ups are going to show up big in this category, and and hopefully we can get a few uh, food trucks on the bubble. Um, it's just because like you know, unless it's like a big food truck thing that does like these big events or or has these sellout type things. You know, it's hard to find all the food trucks out there. It's impossible. And I so, feel like Denver's become a fairly large pop up or uh, pop up and food truck community. Right. But I but you know, I feel like it's it's gonna be tough. Like I the pop ups will definitely be on top of mind on a lot of our voting uh committee. But at the same time, like there's some food trucks out there that hopefully maybe make it on the bubble and like uh once in a lifetime Cinderella story shot. Yeah, you know, I think obviously because we aggregate everybody's scoring, you'll see three or four that really like they'll be leaps and bounds above. They'll have 18 or 20 points. Right. You know, and you're like, okay, they're clear cut. And then everybody will probably have those ones that are ones and twos and threes because it's reverse points. So the people that ranked seven and eight, if those collab on like maybe just one offs, you know, like I love La Via Real, the one that's just right there on the side of Alameda and uh, right off Federal. But that's not a regularly no one. So if it's in my top eight, realistically, in real life, and I put it there honestly, odds are it's going to get beat by somebody that has just something that's there too. Right. Because you know, no one else is going to recommend. So it's there's a little bit of a game. If you want somebody in, you would have to like throw them in the eight in the number one overall spot so that they automatically vault to eight points. Right. You know. So there is like if you are campaigning for somebody, that's one way to do it. But at the same time, I think most folks, especially on the committee, that's why they're all supposed to be impartial. Will not be actively campaigning for a restaurant that they don't earnestly believe is their favorite spot true you know and i think we'll see that in a couple locations but i mean we have some really genius folks that are joining us so i'm excited yeah yeah i think i think this is a much better approach than last year obviously because we just we did thought of like this idea we day. had and we had no idea it would be so much fun um but yeah i think this year including different people who know different things about city and the food scene here i think it's going to be great and obviously, don't get upset if, uh, like, it's just stupid. This is for fun. It's not going to be perfect. It is what it is, so don't get upset about it. Yeah, but if you want to, um, Kip is responsible for all of this. <laughs> so my point, my my eight in all categories will be weighted at 1.25, which means that if there is a tiebreaker and one of them has a decimal point higher than somebody else, we'll know who's the asshole that's behind why this one got in. So shoot all your hatred at me. Uh, I, I Whatever. But don't do that anyways, because yeah. this is fun. Yeah, and we're just trying to have fun and trying to showcase the best. And then we're going to throw four wild cards in there, Chris. So we'll take, you know, we mentioned somebody having 20 points or 18 points. We're just going to see who has, like, everyone that didn't get in, so everybody below the cut line. We'll see who had the most points overall of them all so if there were like you know three people tied at nine but that wasn't enough to get them through in their own division then we would have those three at nine and then whomever would be the the first eight and we would just pick that one randomly i would do it so you wouldn't actually know which one they are but those four wild cards will make a run at it and you know it's just like playing those opening rounds in dayton it's something to gamble on it's something to cheer for and like chris said let's just fucking have some fun with this i know i make a big deal out of it but that's because i like gambling and i love march madness yeah and i love stoned appetites march madness yeah it feels a lot of fun um okay chris so th we have two more topics to talk about this next one's a pretty big deal um i've never gone to spain but i'm going next week to go cover the cannabis events from Spanibus and just eat to my heart's content. So I'll be there for five days. 
Um, there's three days of competition across multiple like clubs because it's not federally legal. So it's done through like clubs and things of that nature. It's kind of like a weird paradigm, I believe. But yeah, so I'll be going to Spanibus. It's the next weekend, the weekend of March 10 through 12. I'll be there covering the events. We're going to interview some of the judges. Um, some There's some Colorado representation, as well as some other folks from the community that will be attending. So we're all going to kind of goof off and have some fun while we're there. We're going to do some tours. We're going to see what the scene looks like across the pond. Now, you, as somebody who went to school over there, can you give me some tips? Do we call it across the pond if we're not going to England? Is it more of like a I lake? mean, it's still over the pond. Like. I know, yeah, but it's like a lot. You know, like that's yeah. a totally different flight. So I just wasn't sure. Do I still say that? Yeah, I probably wouldn't say across the pond because that is more of a British line thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I mean, you're going over the Atlantic. You're going to, is this in, this is in uh, Barcelona? Yeah. So it'll be in Spain. So I'll be down there eating, you know, ham, octopus, edibles, things oh, like that. I mean, do all that that you can. Drink yeah. the wine. Um, yeah, and go to go to a few museums when you're not at the Spanibus events. Yeah, so okay, so there it's there's a lot going on. So there is Spanibus both 10, 11, and 12, and then there's also the Autoflower World Cup, which we're going to interview one of the founders of that cup, and that goes on at a private club that has like 60,000 followers and members. So it's like a I don't know exactly what to expect. Will it be like a trade show? I'm not sure. I know Spanibus is a bigger one it's blown up to you know like it has some very large sponsors and it has a large amount of representation so i imagine that'll be more trade show style but we're going to get to know a lot of the brands that are you know operating across the world we're starting to see it become more legalized in places like thailand and you know across western europe and we know it's a cash cow here in the states so we're going to go see what the the vibes like over there and see you know, smoke some of their kush have a have a blast and try some of the off bean restaurants and report back. So shout out to our friend Wendy Lynn um, over there. She was a guest on the podcast. She lives in Paris. Um, she knows the natural wine and natural bread scene. So she gave me a litany of places to go. But at the same time, you know, we have some friends that have grassroots, uh, the hat company that works in the cannabis space. They have a location down there, and so a friend of ours from there reached out. And then we've also been able to make some friends um, through music and things of that nature. And so we're going to go try restaurants with some locals that know where to get the best octopus and stuff of that nature. And we're going to film all of this and put it on both Mile High Life and Stoned Appetite's YouTube pages. So be sure you're following them. And then make sure you're following us on social media while I'm gone. Um, I'm eight hours ahead, so I have alarms set. So every day, the voting that starts at 9 a.m. here will start at 5 p.m. for me. So right, what, right around 5 every day, I will drop all of the polls from wherever I am. Yeah, you'll do it with a slight buzz. It's going to be great. Yeah, it'll be like a Rioja buzz. <laughs> and a nice, I'm probably going to eat like 50 milligrams when I wake up, jog around you know, the Mediterranean, grab some oysters, shit like that. I'm very excited. I'm excited to see it. Yeah, so thanks to our uh, media passes we got. Uh, so thanks to the, the team over at Spanibus. Thanks to the folks over at the World Cup. Um, LA Weekly's throwing a, a party over there. And so our friends um, have, you know, hooked it up. And so we're going to go join those folks and just see what the vibe is. You know, get a temperature check because we know that there's a lot of uh, panic. And we've seen, you know. A lot of issues going on across America. So I'm, I'm curious to see what maybe plagues the international community and what they're really hyped on. Are they selling distillate cartridges for $65 like Colorado was just four years ago? Um, stuff like that. Um, and then last of us. Last of all. Uh, I, God damn it. Those flashback episodes, they don't give us much and they make us want more. You know? They do. But at the same time, like, ah, I'm just... I mean, like, no way, uh, and I'm blanking on the name right now, um, no way what's-his-name dies, or does he? Or I mean, does he? I mean, we don't know, and so if you're wa- if you're listening to this, we're sorry. Um, we'll, I'll go add in spoiler alert at the 47-minute mark, but we don't know what's going to happen, Chris, and that's the greatest part about it. I didn't play the video game, so I don't know what is going on in terms of, like, 
is it meant to be a two person he's always protecting her at kind of show or is it do, do you get more people in your camp like we don't know so we got to find out without giving spoilers away so one question for you and that one, we didn't give a spoiler away whether or not he dies or not but question for you do you think if you were in that situation would you stay with kind of the federal if you were brought up through those schools or do you think you would jump ship and go with like the resistance like fireflies and stuff as someone who hated every real job he's had working under fluorescent lighting and in the last year cut his own safety net out from underneath him i would like to believe that i would just try to go find your nick offerman type people and see if you can join that community you know We've learned that you don't have to be the biggest community to make a, a difference in somebody's lives. And so maybe it, you just needed to be a 10 person community or, you know, maybe that Wyoming, that Wyoming community thought that Jackson Hole vibe. I would have stayed there. I'd have been like, look, uh, <laughs> I'm not leaving these grounds ever again. Um, that's what I would have done. I don't think I would have, like, I don't like being micromanaged and they're like, oh, you get, here's your rations for doing your chores. I don't think that would have done well for me. I would have rather have been a little bit more free spirited. What about you? I don't know. Cause I don't, I don't know how much more free. I mean, unless you can get outside and be and find one of those communities. Like if you're in like a QZ area, you have like one or two options. Like, you're going to be with a resistance group. Which... So, like, if you were one of the survivors in Denver and there was, like, an enca- a camp, like, kind of like up near Red Feather Lake, or you could stay in the Denver QZ, would you chance it to try to go find maybe, like, cleaner air, brighter life? Or would you just be like, I'm content for rations? Because it is kind of weird with that. Like, you're that fr- – you remember the days before, you know, quarantining zones and things of that nature. Right. You know, I would try, are you just I, like, fuck it, I'm done with this. I'll, I'll just live out my days here. I would try and look for a, for a community off the grid. But, you know, you got to be packing heat and shit if you want to make that journey. Like, if, you, if you're trying to find something, like... You probably... I would go up to, like, the Northern Territory, you know, where it's not populated, and just be like, if we can make it up here, just have your own farm, jam a bunch of stuff in the summer, you know? Pickle some tomatoes and have them through winter. Kill a bunch of meat. See if you can keep it cold. You know. So, so question though, where would you want to be on in the U.S.? What region? West? Just north. Of Midwest? Us. Just north of us. Okay. Um, because I like the cold weather. Um, I feel like I can thrive in that weather. I don't think thrive is the proper word. I can survive with the community up there and not be miserable. And I feel like the east is fairly populated, and if you go south, like El Paso's got a lot of fucking people. There's nobody north. So if, like, the the likelihood of, you know, infected finding you before you find what is known to be a camp, I would choose the west, the mountain west. You also get, yeah, because you got to got you, you gotta think about natural resources, food, you know, what you can grow. There's a lot of... There's a lot of food options out here. Yeah, it's a little more fertile land. You're right. But, like, California is probably crazy packed, so it's, like, totally infested. Like, I would try to get north of here. Like, and you know 70 is a fucking nightmare. Like, <laughs> in deep impact when they all try to, like, get up on top of a mountain. It's like, why didn't you think of that originally? Like, why did y'all just, just like, take this on the chin right here on the interstate? Like, and, and I feel like in the West you have a better chance of finding, like, a big gun arsenal. Like in the outlying communities, you yeah, know? Like, like one of those people that's infected and is not in their home, you could find like a couple shotguns and like one of those MAGA hats. Yeah, you definitely will. Um, but that wraps up the first part of March Madness. We're going to have some of our committee members join us through Zoom to talk about the selection Sunday, which is not selection Sunday, selection Wednesday, <laughs> um, as we go to market on Thursday when you're listening to the next episode. So get ready. It's going to be a fucking doozy of a month. Talk to y'all Thursday. Cheers.